mass of blossoms, spacious surroundings, a house and a setting that would appeal to any keen gardener. Heather Campbell, who lives here, is a fanatical gardener and she appreciates her good fortune. Her garden grows a profusion of exotic plants like jacaranda and bougainvillea. She's also a keen orchid grower. She can raise orchids out of doors because this garden is in the tropics. Heather lives on the outskirts of Nairobi, capital city of Kenya, with husband Bob Campbell. Like any garden, wild animals visit. Some are more welcome than others. Snakes are regular and welcome visitors because they eat garden pests. These tree hyraxes are so tame, they're almost pets. And at the bottom of the garden, Heather Campbell has warthogs. Certain problems are universal to all gardens, though in the tropics the weeds do grow faster than those in cool, temperate regions. British gardeners may have problems with pigeons and squirrels. In Africa, there are garden pests too. This is a ground squirrel. A party of mouse birds attacks the tomatoes, together with a streaky seed eater. Insects do particularly well in Africa. The collective Swahili word for them is dudus. Not all of them are destructive. This praying mantis is designed to look like a dead leaf. The camouflage, which isn't effective on a blossom, helps it to catch other insects, many of which are harmful to the garden. Most gardeners are familiar with native pests, but when the African bush extends beyond the garden's boundaries, the problems of protecting cultivated plants can get a little more complicated. The Campbell's house looks out towards the wild Ngong hills. There's still some game in the Ngongs, and some of it finds its way down into this suburb of Nairobi. Giraffes frequently look over the garden fence. But they're far too shy to intrude, and in any case, they prefer to feed on the tops of the tall acacia trees. Antelopes are regular visitors. These impala are too timid to venture very close to people's homes. Heather often watches the impalas from her windows. She enjoys their company. But not all antelope are quite so welcome. This little antelope, the diker, often makes successful night raids among the flower beds. The warthogs at the bottom of the Campbell's garden wander out of the bush during the day. They can devastate vegetable and flower beds with their formidable tusks. They're also capable of grubbing out the deepest roots.
The Campbells can't stop them getting in, but try to minimise the damage they cause by keeping them at the bottom of the garden. The Sykes monkeys are quite a different proposition. They're agile enough to raid plants that are out of the reach of most other animals. Wild fruits are part of their natural diet. Cultivated varieties are just bigger and better. From their lookout posts in the bush, they watch to see when the garden is unoccupied. Where wildlife is concerned, the African gardener has to deal with many destructive pests. But there are compensations in terms of sheer beauty. In a sandy bank right below the house, a colony of little bee-eaters is excavating nesting holes. This elaborate nest is being made by a female bronze sunbird. She tucks in feathers which she takes from a previous half-completed nest that for some reason she decided to abandon. For the Campbells, a commonplace garden object like a bird table becomes a showcase for living jewels. Here, boy. Tiny finches like the red-cheeked cordon bleu are almost as common as sparrows. Those aren't sparrows, but bronze mannequins. Several species of weavers come to feed. This is a female Reichenau's weaver. An olive thrush. A vitaline masked weaver. The colour and variety of the bird life in this garden is breathtaking and a joy to everyone living in the area. The bird bath attracts a golden-breasted bunting. And a male bronze sunbird. Sunbirds are among the brightest gems in the African garden. The females are rather drab, but the males often have resplendent feathers. This is a male variable sunbird. Sunbirds are nectar feeders, exactly like the hummingbirds of the New World. Unlike hummingbirds, they can't hover. They perch, often upside down, to probe deep inside the blossoms with their long, curved beaks. Around 300 species of birds visit or live in the garden. There are many other permanent residents. African squirrels are just as likely to steal food put out for the birds as squirrels in British gardens.
the tree hyraxes have become so tame that they often venture into the house. There's little harm in them as garden residents, though the blood-curdling screams they utter at night and in the early morning can be disconcerting. They're largely nocturnal, descending to feed at night. They climb with great ease, but they're not quite so agile on the ground. Amazingly, despite the huge difference in their sizes, the hyrax's closest relatives are the elephants. There are at least three kinds of chameleon in the Campbell's garden, and all are welcome as controllers of garden pests. These are young Jackson's chameleons. The adults have three horns on their heads. Some chameleons, including Jackson's, bear live young instead of laying eggs. Their young are active from birth. A Hernal's chameleon, sometimes called the black-eyed chameleon. They catch insects with an extremely long, sticky tongue. At dawn, some scaly francolins, which are rather like partridges, creep under the garden fence to look for seeds in the flower beds. Helmeted guinea fowl move furtively among the shrubs. A young warthog grazes on the lawn. A diker picks its way cautiously back towards the wilder environment just outside the garden. The Campbells are naturalists, and so they never take reprisals against these raiders. At the expense of a few plants, they're glad to see most of them around. Even the Sykes monkeys are tolerated. They're at their boldest very early in the morning when there's nobody about in the garden. Tomatoes are a favorite. French beans too. Almost every gardener in the world dislikes rats. The species which visits the Campbell's garden is in some ways more of a pest than most. It's a giant rat, 
pattern is about half a meter in length. Some Kenyans catch these creatures for food. They have the reputation of being delicious to eat. When the dogs are let out, the wild occupants retreat back to the bush. But nothing will divert or disturb these creatures from their purpose. These are safari ants, which are known for destroying all life in their path. Insects, reptiles, and even small mammals overtaken by them don't have much chance. Here, they're devouring a dead bird. They work as a unit, each ant responding to chemical signals. A group of safari ant soldiers stands on guard. Their job is to protect the workers from attack. It's possible to see where the river of ants changed its course to engulf the dead bird. Within minutes, this was all that was left of the bird. An infestation of young grasshoppers often quickly takes on plague proportions. The temptation for most gardeners is to resort to chemicals. Man-made concoctions are the most effective way of getting rid of insect pests, at least in the short term. But the Campbells are extremely careful as to what they use to control their abundant pests. In the long term, their caution has paid off. Chemicals are all too often indiscriminate killers. They destroy harmful insects, but they eradicate the useful ones too. It doesn't stop there either. Chemicals can cause serious damage to animals higher in the food chain, including people. With so much wonderful wildlife here, it will be tragic to destroy it by using toxic chemicals. Fortunately, the fertility of the garden more than matches the persistence of the pests. Heather Campbell often wonders who she's running this beautiful garden for, her animal guests or herself, especially when she finds a tree hyrax nibbling one of her orchids. A visit to the vegetable garden usually reveals damage caused by the early morning raids of the Sykes monkeys. Droughts in Britain sometimes cause problems for gardeners, but in Kenya, the inhabitants have to cope with the dry season every year. 
The birds come to rely on the city water supply almost as much as the gardener does. A leaking tap provides vital water for many species of birds. A tree hyrax calls at dusk. The Campbells like its weird cry. They make wildlife films, and at night they feel reassured, where city dwellers might be dismayed, to know that just beyond their garden fence, wild creatures are living as their next door neighbors. They often hear the cough of a leopard. They've seen leopards in the garden itself, and they hunt in the bush just beyond. By night, it's as if the man-made orderliness of the garden does not exist. The sounds of wild Africa take over. When the sun comes up, the place looks like a well-planned and well-kept garden again. But in the center of the lawn, there's a reminder of where this is. A predator has made its kill. The African bush, together with all its wild inhabitants, is just a few meters away, at the bottom of this spectacular garden. Weekday nights just wouldn't be the same without a hefty helping of five wildlife. Tomorrow at 7.30, the first of a new series, Oasis Africa, looks at the mating behaviour of frogs. Ribbit, ribbit.